My name is Hardy. Oliver Norval Hardy. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Laurel. <laughs> Welcome to this very special bonus episode of the Laurel and Hardy podcast. I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog and the upcoming book, Laurel and Hardy Silence. And on today's show, we are stepping away from our usual deep dive into the film history of Laurel and Hardy, and instead, we'll be turning our attention to the stage. Today's guest is a veteran stage and TV actor who is currently on tour with his long-running one-man play entitled, And This Is My Friend, Mr. Laurel. Best known for his TV roles in classic UK TV sitcom Heidi High, today I'm talking Laurel and Hardy with Geoffrey Holland. <laughs> On today's special edition of the podcast, I'm honoured to be joined by the wonderful Geoffrey Holland. Geoffrey is someone who can rightly be referred to as a member of UK TV royalty. His acting career on both stage and screen over the years has been prolific, appearing in such TV classics as Dad's Army, Are You Being Served, It Ain't Half Hot Mum, Russ Abbott's Madhouse, The Kenny Everett Television Show, Spitting Image, Soap Opera's Crossroads and Coronation Street, but he became a household name for his leading roles in the celebrated sitcoms Heidi High, You Rang My Lord and Oh Dr. Beeching. Since 2013, however, he's been touring with his one-man stage show entitled And This Is My Friend, Mr. Laurel, which is why he's joining us today. So it gives me immense pleasure to say, Geoffrey Holland, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy podcast. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's lovely to be here. It's wonderful to have you with us, Jeffrey. I am a huge you've fan. reading all that list of stuff? I've been around the block, haven't I? Do you feel tired now? <laughs> <laughs> it is, well, I mean, that that was just a, a tip of the iceberg. You know, the, your, the list of, of productions that you've been involved in, both stage and screen, Jeffrey, is just phenomenal. I mean, prolific is the word. You've been in so much stuff. It's, it's just unbelievable. And you really are, a, you know, a part of my childhood and upbringing. Um, you know, me and my family would watch Heidi High of a Saturday evening eating sausage sandwiches and I remember it very very well so it is lovely to have this chance to, to chat with you um, especially about Laurel and Hardy um, so what I'd like to do what, what, what I wanted to say is um, the, the thing when people mention your name to me or if ever I hear your name there's one thing that stands out for me and it's not Heidi High there's, there was a moment and this is years ago end of the 1980s early 90s you were on something like GMTV of a morning you will probably won't remember this because it was a very tiny thing i think you were being interviewed on GMTV good morning television for something um, and you were on you were on like a live feed like a, you were on a tv screen you weren't actually in the studio uh, and right at the end of the interview the chap whoever it was said to you oh and i believe you do a good stan laurel impersonation and all you said was i certainly do and did the nod, and it was, and that has stuck in my mind ever since. So this so to have this chance now brings it full circle for me because that's lived with me for, forever. It's just really, really odd. I don't remember that moment. I must admit, no, but I'm I've sure done, you don't. I've done that a few times because it's a very, very handy little phrase. Yes, oh, it certainly is. Yeah. It certainly is. <laughs> um, Brilliant. So, okay. So, um, if you could tell us, if we could just we we'll start with your earliest memories of Laurel and Hardy, Jeffrey. Uh, you know how you were introduced to the boys would be wonderful. Well, like a lot of people my age, I started with the Saturday morning picture shows right. when I was a boy growing up in the nineteen fifties, and uh, you know we used to go down and pay our sixpence or our ninepence and go and sit in the, the cinema, the ABC, and uh, and watch the kids' programs. You know there was usually a western, a Roy Rogers western, or Hopper or Cassidy, a Mickey Mouse cartoon, and you know an episode of Flash Gordon, and <laughs> you know whatever, and, and hopefully a Laurel and Hardy. You know most most weeks they showed a Laurel. And Hardy, and um, that was where I sort of fell in love with them, and they be, they became my friends. Yes, because as a small boy, I identified with them as as getting into trouble, you know, because yes. little boys used to get into trouble with authority. Will you brats keep quiet? How do you expect me to concentrate? Well, Oliver won't let me play with my blocks. Will you leave Stanley alone? And play quietly? Certainly, if you must make a noise, make it quietly. Make a noise quietly. Well, that's exactly what Stan and Ollie used to do. They get into trouble with these, you know, authority figures and policemen and all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, 
that was what how I identified with them originally, you know, uh, and that's uh, they just was so innocent and childlike yeah. to me. Uh, the, you know, I sort of bonded with them, and that was that was something that stayed with me all my life. Yeah, that's sort of it's funny. A lot, you know, so many of us say that, that they are our friends, and that is how, exactly how it feels, isn't it? Do, yes. do, do you ever feel that way about any other comedians that you've seen on the screen? Not really. No, I, I like I liked Norman Wisdom. I think when I was a, a kid as well, I liked his films. Who, yeah. you know, you get into slapstick trouble and all the rest of it. And it was nice to know that Stan and Babe actually met him and and, and praised him up and thought the world of him. You know. Yes. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but Laurel and Hardy were, were it for me. Yeah, I never liked Chaplin. I was never a, a fan of Chaplin. Now the man made some wonderful movies. You know, he made, he did some great work. I'm not taking that away from him. Yeah. Uh, but you know, for me, uh, his technique uh, was wanting. I thought you could you could hear the wheels turning. Right. Okay. You know what I mean, um, but with Stan and Babe, it was just you just got love. Yeah. You know, it was love there. There was love in those films. Yeah. In, in the right way. In, I mean, the right way, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very, very about, enormous amount. Those characters cared about each other enormously, although they fought yeah. like cat and dog all the time. You know, you knew damn well that they they were, you know, they'd die for each other if you, if you came to it. That's it. And they very nearly did a number of times. <laughs> 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 yeah, in real life, they probably would have done, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. And I think that that is the thing. It's, the, it's that partnership. It's that love between the two of them. And... Yeah. Uh, and th- there's always that point in the films where they lose everything apart from their friendship. They've always got that at the end. They can have exactly. wealth and, and whatever else it, throughout the film, but they will lose everything apart from each other, which is just wonderful. That's it. Yeah, exactly that. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, as, a, as an actor and, and, and comedian, how do you think your your career has been inspired, Jeffrey, by by the, the, the great silent clowns, I guess, but particularly Laurel and Hardy? Has it had an inspiration on you? Well, they were, you know, um, because uh, I've always had an aptitude for comedy. I suppose it was just one of those things that that came along um, by accident for me. You know, I mean, I I was very lucky when I started out after my three years at drama school. I went straight into rep. Um, I went straight to the Belgrade Theatre of Coventry in 1968. I did nearly five years there in rep, learning trade and doing everything from, you know, uh, melodramas, Fat cap, you know, northern comedies and pantomimes, musicals. I even danced in West Side Story. Can you believe that? Wow! When I was twenty, when I was twenty-three, you know, did you do all the finger clicks? I did say I did all that. That was I was there with the Jets. I was in the Jets. Uh, yeah, and uh, I learned the trade. And of course, whenever, whenever comedy came up, and there was anything comedy, it was used to be there for me. And I always used to put in for my own benefit uh, if I was playing in a, in a comedy a little gesture of some kind that was either Stan or Babe. Oh, lovely! Just for my own amusement. Yes. You know, it might have it might have just been a a, a touch of the tie. Yes. And a raised eyebrow and a quizzical look for, for Stan, or it, it might have been the, the arms up in the air like Babe used to do, you know, <laughs> something like that. One, one or, or the other of them. I used to used to put that in just for my own amusement, no, which no, of course no. it fitted in the show. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been there, you know. Yes. But yeah. uh, things like that. But they, they were my guardian angels as far as comedy was concerned, really. Yeah. You know, and uh, and it stood me in good stead. In fact, Definitely. there is an episode of Heidi High that we uh, was specially written uh, by Jimmy and David because uh, we talked about Paul Shade and I was it. He was a bit, as big a fan as, as me. Was he really? Yeah. Of Laurel and Hardy, and we used to talk about them all the time in rehearsal. We used to act them out, oh. and, and you know, play play the two of them. And, and they wrote a little bit of an episode really that included Laurel and Hardy, uh, just for me. Oh, uh, we nice. did them in the stage show when we put the stage show on. You know, the summer season. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Heidi High. We there was a, a spot in the second half where several of us dressed up as famous film stars of the of the yes. A year, yeah. Paul Shade and I dressed up and came on as, as uh, Stan and Babe and sang the Trail of the Lonesome Pine oh, live fantastic. every night, every night live. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. I did all the voices. I did the three voices that Stan sang with his own. Did you really? The, the Chilwell's bass voice, and also the Sabrina, you know, the uh, 
the soprano at the end were from Rosina. <laughs> and I did I did that right at the end, but I couldn't do it now. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Couldn't do it now. Well, unless we get kicked somewhere, we'd rather not be kicked. Yeah, <laughs> okay, don't make me this tight anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was good, great, great fun. Yeah, fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, you mentioned Paul Shane. You, your partnership with him is it was obviously a, a very you know. It was a partnership. Did you take any kind of a, um, a lead from Stan Babe's uh, interactions in, in the way that you performed in, over the years? Well, you know, we when we the day we met for the first time, there was a, there was a spark, there was a magic there, there was something just went click. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I first met the man, I walked into the rehearsal room. He'd been called down to London <clears throat> to read a couple of scenes with me because I'd already been cast as Spike right. at that time and they were, I had a bit of trouble trying to find a Ted Bovis when Jimmy saw Paul Shade on Coronation Street he rang David and said have you got Corey on put it on I think we found our Ted Bovis <laughs> and then they, they got him down to London and I walked into the room to meet him I put my hand out and said hello Paul I'm Jeff nice to meet you uh, and he, he looked at me he, he shook my hand and he looked at me sideways and he said we met before <laughs> because he felt it as the same as I did. That, that, that instant connection between us, there was just some sort of electricity, some chemistry there. Yeah. You know, and I think that really should have showed in the in the work we did over the years. Also, we worked together. But, uh, yeah, it was just a magic moment, and we, we hit it off from day one, and, and uh, you, well, you've seen the result. Yeah, it certainly comes across on the screen. Yeah, it certainly does. Um so uh, just so we're talking today about your 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 one man show and this is my friend Mr Laurel. Uh, yes. Can you can you sort of explain a little bit about the genesis of that? How did that come about? What was the idea from that, Jeffrey? Well, you know, uh, I said about when I was a, a little boy, I, I fell in love with Laurel and Hardy. You know, your life changes, you grow up. You know, your priorities change. And and uh, when I was in the uh, in in the seventies and when I was in my early twenties, working as a young actor at the time, the BBC started to show them on television. And again, and uh, in the early evening, and then I, I sort of my love for them was sort of rekindled at that time. And I thought, you know, in, in the seventies, one person shows were becoming quite uh, the mode. You know, with one one or two around, and thought it was like a good idea. Yeah. And I, I just got the idea at the time that wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to do a one man show about Stan Laurel. Because a nobody's ever done a one man show about half a double act before. <laughs> That's true. And uh, and you know it's an amazing story. Yeah. His life is you know what what he got up to, what happened to him through his life. Yeah. It's an incredible story to tell. So I thought, well, that's got to be a couple of good reasons to do it. But then I realised um, I couldn't do it at that time because I was too young. <laughs> you know, you can't tell a life story until you have a life. Uh, and the, the idea sat in the back of my mind for a long, long time, and I actually waited over 40 years before I got that show on its feet. Uh, and it happened quite by chance, as I always knew it would. Uh, you know, really deep down, I've sort of felt when it's right, it'll happen. Uh, and it did. And I was uh, out with my wife, Judy. We were at a charity show. Uh, supporting a friend of, her, of ours who was in the show. Uh, and we met an actress that we knew, saying, you know, like we always do, what are you up to? Are you busy? And, and she was busy. She was doing a one-woman show uh, locally nearby in Guildford. And uh, she said, it's amazing. She, you know, the, the writing is incredible. And this woman who was who written it for her, you know, she won awards for her plays yeah. and, uh, and written a lot of stuff for one person and two people. That was a kind of speciality. So uh, she, I said, well, I'm looking for someone to help me actually put together a, a one-man show about Stan Laurel. Because, you know, I, I tried to have a go. I met someone. But we, we couldn't get like, get it together. And we shook hands and walked away. Right. Um Oh, but, you know, I was still looking. And uh, so we went along to see this play uh, that our friend was in, and she was right. The writing was absolutely superb. Uh, and I met the, the 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 author, Gail Lowe, in the in the bar after the show uh, over a glass of wine, and she said, oh, you're the one who wants to do the one-man show about Stan Laurel, are you? Oh, she, I said, oh, she told you, did she? And she said, yes, she did. She said, when do we start? Oh, brilliant. 
Brilliant. So, you know, that, that's what it happened. We, could, we collaborated on, on that. I gave. She didn't know much about Laurel and Hardy. Okay. She knew who they were, um, but she didn't know much about them at all other than what she'd seen on the screen. I have nothing to say. So I gave her all the books uh, she needed to look through to, for research and everything. And then she wrote me this play. This She wrote the bulk of the text of this play. I, I put various bits and pieces in myself. Yeah. I put all the comedy in for a start. Right. Uh, and uh, and some little anecdotes that I wanted in there yeah. uh, for the, you know, for the telling of the story. Uh, and she went along with all that. And I, But I gave her, uh, this, this, this is the crux of the matter, really, the timing. I gave her free reign yeah. to set the play in time and, and place um, wherever she thought it was best to right. tell the story. Right. So she set the play in Oliver Hardy's sick room, his bedroom, right. after the stroke in September 1956. Yeah. And Stan comes in, that's the premise of the play. I've just got a little bed frame on the stage made of white tubing. It just says, it says bed, you know, that's all it is. A little white chair. Yeah. And, and me in the suit, I carry the hat on. And put the, you know, and, and it's, it's Stan just turns up to visit his poor sick friend and, and talks. I didn't have anything else to do, so I thought I'd drop in and see you. I just reminisces and about their lives together, but they, you know, all the stuff they've done, uh, and it really, really works well. You know, very occasionally, I, the lights change. I put the hat on, and you get a, you know, you get Laurel and Hardy from me because oh, I do, you know, several of the clips from the movies oh, that fantastic. people know, yeah. and then go back into the into the narrative. And, and but you know, the the timing of this was so incredible because Gail set it in September '56. And in September 56, as you know, Stan Laurel was 66 years old. Yes. And in, when we sat and stood it on its feet for the very first time, Jeffrey Holden was 66. Oh, how funny. So, you know, and I, was, I turned to Judy and I said, there you are. You see, I told you it forward to place when it was right. <laughs> well, it, was, it couldn't have been better. It's written in the you know, I've, been, yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years. I'm 76 now, but it doesn't matter because, you know, as long as I can still walk and breathe, and then, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. But that was when it started, you know, when it was right. And I waited Absolutely. for 40 years to get that up. Yeah. And, and here we are. That's brilliant. Do you find it, I mean, it's obviously a very... I would, I would imagine it's a very emotional kind of a thing because obviously if you're in Oliver Hardy's sickbed and, and for us, you know, hardcore fans, yes. you know, I remember reading John McCabe's book and at the end it describes, you know, Stan sitting there and Ollie yes. could talk sure. and it was all in the eyes. And that, I found that so emotional. Yeah. Um, how quite how is that for you to, to perform that you know, on, a, on a regular basis? How do you find that? Is that is it quite draining for you? It's or no is that... problem at all. It's a, I mean, it's a labour of love for me, this play, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I do get emotional in it uh, at certain times because it's all part of the narrative. It's yeah. you know part of the story, yeah. um, and it's, good, it's no problem really as an actor. It's what I do, yeah. but um, in it, it's you know. But there's all the things in the play that people don't know about. Like in people don't know that he had a little boy who was only nine days old when he died. Yeah. Things like that, you know, and the, and the money that he lost in, in the crash of Wall Street crash and, and all those things and the, the houses, the property, the women in their lives, of the which lives. there were many. Of course, you know, we all know that. that us fans know it. Yeah. But, the, you know, the, the, the public, general public, don't really know all that, you see. That's yeah. what makes the play so wonderful for me to tell, to yeah. the story. Yeah. I think that's the thing, you know, with the, the, the Stan and Ollie movie that came out in 2018, it, a lot of criticism was put at it because of the, the 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 things that were in there that weren't actually factual. And people obviously take that away, and a lot of people think that things that happened in there, you know, that they had an argument and Stan threw a bread roll at Ollie's head and, you know, Hal Roach was a, um, one of these stereotypical sort of cartoon um, Hollywood producers, you know, and it just, it just wasn't that way, you know. So oh. to, to have... To have a fan put it on stage who knows, you know, as you do, the, 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 the real story, I think, is... You're getting the truth from yeah. me. You're getting the truth. You know, I saw the movie, Stan and Ollie, uh, and I had to go and see it twice. Yeah. Because when I saw it for the first time, I was absolutely incensed <laughs> at, the, at, at the historical inaccuracies of which yeah. there were 
hundreds throughout the film. Yeah. Uh, and then I went home and I thought about it for a bit. And I thought, well, Jeff Pope, who wrote the screenplay, you know, he's a, he's a very accomplished writer and he's written some amazing things over the years. And uh, sort of looked at what he did and why he did it. And he needed to do that, I think. He needed to create a light and shade, ups and downs. You know, yeah. he, gave, he gave them that argument, you know, when, when uh, Stan's contract was up and he, he walked out yeah. in order to get Roach to see things his way, which, of course, he never did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they went on to work. And, and, you know, we all know that Stan was happy with that. Yeah. But Pope used it as an excuse to create um, conflict. Yeah. You know, and we, you know, it, it's one of those things that we we can't tolerate because it's right. not true. It's not true. But uh, yeah. uh, you know, he, he wrote a good piece of cinema. When you look oh, yes. at yeah, you know, it's it's a good piece of cinema. Yeah. So when I went back to see it the second time, I put that in a box in my head. I locked the door, threw away the key, and just sat and watched the film as a piece of cinema, and yeah. you know, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that's good. the impersonations were, were, were wonderful. Yeah, so, so the, the I think the acting there was there such a lot in to, to um, you know to to approve to approve mm -hmm. of, but uh, and I, I do remember, and a lot of people mentioned on social media that the sort of the final scenes with the um, the shadows dancing, and, and that was that was very oh. well done. That was very. I mean, I, I was, that was too, clever. That was a, that was a quote from one of the Robert Young uh, compilations, you know, because the, the narrator at the end says, you know, the, these uh, the two men are gone, but on strips of film where time stands still, they have left their shadows behind. Yes. And that was what they did on the stage in the theatre when they were dancing. And I thought that was so clever because that was a, that was a, an homage to, to that piece of footage, I think. Yes. Yeah, I think that was lovely. I think it, what I would have liked to have seen... Um, would have you know as the credits rolled is some actual footage of the boys just at the end if that you know I mean there may have been copyright issues with that I don't know but it would have been nice just to leave leave us with the real thing yes yeah and and also for people who are coming to that film not knowing Laurel and Hardy would have, just get some snippets of the actual you know the real because you know you can reenact as much as you want but it's never going to match the real thing because it was just no, such, such flawlessly natural performances just wonderful yeah. 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 <laughs> I agree with you. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> That's it. But then again, it could have. I always think it could have been a lot worse. We've had a lot worse in the past. For, you know, with with. Well, uh, we you know. have. Yes, we have. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, uh, so how so how long? I mean, I think it was 2013. You started this play, Jeff. Was that yeah? Yeah. And, and so, how far and why does it gone? It's, well, I've I've, uh, I'd, I've done it at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival three times. I'm sold out now. Right, I'm right. going back next next year, 23. Yeah. With it again, just to give it a final outing before I'm too old. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see what we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm working towards that idea, but you know, as long as people keep asking, well, I've got some requests in for it now. Oh, lovely! I'm looking. I'm looking to putting dates in the diary for next year. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm there. I'm at pool on the 26th, as you know, because you very kindly gave me a, a plug in the magazine. Yes, yes. And uh, so you know, we'll, we'll keep going as long as people want it. Yeah, but so, so, so Pool and Dorset out. is the next is, is your next one. Pool and yes. Dorset, okay, that's the twenty sixth of November. We'll give that a good plug. Um, well, I'll I'll be there on the night. Actually, we uh, me, me and Russell are going to come down. Oh, uh, and oh that's and great! See yeah. the show. Really, really looking forward to that, Jeffrey. It's going to be. Uh, well, I'll certainly see you in the bar afterwards for a bit. I look forward to it. Or three, because it's it, unfortunately it. seven o'clock, so it's an early one. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's all. I apologise for the Q and A because you know it'll all go over your head if there's a Q and A and talk about Laurel and Hardy. You know you'll know <laughs> the answers. But uh, no, no, it, I'll, I'll think of some good ones for you. I'll come up with some good <laughs> questions for you. <laughs> we'll we'll test you. We'll learn you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, what I was interested to actually ask you as well, Jeff, is is having. You know, being being such a fan of of Stan Laurel, particularly for so long, and then finally getting to play him for ten years, as you say, do you feel any different towards him now that you've played him? Do you feel closer to him, or do you feel like you you, you know him better? Or I think you know, you, I'm, I'm privileged as much as I, I I play him, but I don't I don't impersonate him. I impersonate him more when I put the hat on and do the characters, yeah. you know. Uh, do the voice, do the voices as best I can. I try, I try out my Ollie as well, but you know, but uh, but I don't do an impression of him. Uh, but I, you know, it was so somebody once said in, in a review they wrote about. I get under the skin of the man, 
you know, and, and uh, to, you know, be be there for what you know for what happened to him in his life. Yeah, and yeah. talk about you know, but uh, yeah, I think I've got to know him a bit better because you know you realise when you're watching the films what actually went into it. Yeah, you know that 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 piece of, of comedy dialogue that you what you're watching them do is largely improvised. Yes, <laughs> based on a, a discussion they had before they, somebody said action. Yeah. You know, uh, and they didn't. They didn't have any scripts. I do touch on that in the play. Yeah. You know, so this, this actor came and wanted to rehearse, and that was a story that actually Henry Brandon told me himself. Oh, wonderful! He told me himself about that. He, he had a. I met him at the '84 convention in Ulverston. Right. We had a pint together at the Stand Laurel Pub, and uh, and he was talking about you know when he when he turned up, he wanted to do something as Barnaby. You know, um, Silas Barnaby, and uh, so Stan came out with this new bit of stuff, and he said, well, "Are we going to rehearse it?" You know, and Stan said, "What do you want to spoil it?" <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's, I mean, that's true. That's what I wanted to put. That's one of the things I put into the into the play. That, oh, fantastic! You know, I wanted I wanted that little tale told. Yes. You know, because yeah. it's true. I mean, the stuff you know they did it was just amazing. Their, their chemistry was yeah. so unique that yeah. they could anticipate each other. You know. And they, as they did, yeah. with some wonderful comedy routines. You know. Yeah. But you know, I, I, nothing but admiration for the man, really. When I'm when I'm pretending to be him, if you like. Yes. Yeah. Nothing but admiration for him. It's one of those frustrating things, isn't it? Where we, we as fans, always you, you would love to meet your heroes, and you know, obviously, they've been dead and gone for so long. And also the fact that. You know, there are so many Hal Roach Studios alumni that have been interviewed and, and we've got their, their testimony and all the rest of it and, uh, and their reminiscences. But that's all we have for Stan and Babe. We don't, nobody's ever managed to get to them um, to, to actually find out what kind of people they were. So we have to rely on the, the, the tales from other people. Yes, exactly. Um, and yes. Uh, have you ever worked with anybody, Jeff, that's, that, that met them or that worked with them? Uh, well, uh, well, I say Henry Brandon. Yeah. And on that particular occasion, I had lunch with Rosina Lawrence as well. On that. Oh, fantastic! Visit. Uh, we had some good old fish and chips together you know, <laughs> in, in the Coronation Hall, uh, which was really wonderful for me. I mean, I asked the question that she must have been asked a million times. Uh, uh, said, "What did Stan say to you in that phone box?" It was all a phone box. It was a cupboard. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. he. He was rabbiting onto her and doing all that, and and she, you know, she said, "Well, I don't know, you know, she, I couldn't, she couldn't remember." And it no. was because he was, he was, he was ad libbing and just he was mugging. Really, he wasn't yes. actually talking. It was just for the camera. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I had to ask her, but yeah. she, she was terribly sweet. And it was a lovely thing I, I shall never forget. You know, having lunch with her. That's amazing. Oh, it just seems so unreal because to think that you've actually had. Fish and chips with the lady with Mary Roberts. With Mary it's Roberts, I know. Yeah, I know it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's, yeah. just, it's the one cartoon characters to me. It's just like they, they can't be real people. It's just not, you know. <laughs> Who's there? Mary. Mary who? Mary. Mary Christmas. It's fabulous. I met Jimmy Murphy as well. His valet, you know. Oh, yeah. He was invited as a guest to that particular convention. We went on an open top bus around Blackpool. And Jimmy Murphy spotted Brian London, the boxer, in the street. Right. And he was yelling, Brian, Brian, Brian. He was completely obsessed <laughs> with this boxer, Brian London. And because uh, we went out of range and he had to stop and settle down. But, he, you know, he, he was, again, that was a nice experience. Yes. Yeah. Do you ever think when you're, um, when you're treading the boards in, in the theatres as well, that Stan and Babe were on those same stages? Have you shared? Because obviously they did such a extensive tour of the UK. I've been, yes, I have been to a lot of theatres where they played, you know, and it's nice to stand on the stage and think they stood here. Yes, I was in Dublin a couple of years ago and uh, went to the, the Olympia Theatre there where they played. Yeah. I'd just taken for a special visit. You know, the, ban the management was very kind, and uh, like, we, I couldn't get onto the stage there because there was a big rock band set being set up for a gig they got on that right. night. So uh, I wasn't able to set on the stage. But uh, I've, I've actually stood on on the stage in Plymouth at the Palace, the uh, Palace Theatre, which is that you know they made their final appearance ever. Yeah, yeah. The seventeenth, nineteen fifty four. Yes. Uh, when Babe was taken ill, and I had to cancel the week. Oh, but I, I stood on the stage when I was doing panto there with Gary Wilmot back in the nineties or the early the early teens, I think. And uh, 
my wife arranged it for me. Judy arranged for a little party of us to be taken down the road to the palace and let in and have a walk around. And, you know, I could swear I could hear Babe fighting for breath oh, in that dressing yeah. room. You know, it was, it was quite dramatic. But we, I stood on the middle of the stage with Gary. And I've got a yeah. picture of me and Gary Wilmot standing there where, where Babe and Stan stood. Oh, lovely. For that That's last funny. time. Yeah. That's smashing. Brilliant. Um, now, what I, what I really want to ask you, uh, Jeffrey, I ask all my guests that come onto the podcast is the atoll question. Um, so named uh, for um, it's a, it's a deserted atoll. You are about to be stranded on a deserted atoll. There's an atoll discs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly does it yeah it does at all discs uh, or does at all flicks so we should probably call it yeah. um, so we're, we're going to allow you to take with you onto your deserted at all four laurel and hardy related items the first is a silent short the second is a talky short uh the third is a feature film and the fourth is a laurel and hardy related book right um so can you can you make your selections and briefly explain why you've chosen them well i think for the silent short for me, it would have to be the finishing touch. Oh, yes, my favourite. Because uh, about, uh, we created a fiction, fictitious company uh, when we started Mr. Laurel. It was um, uh, the finishing touch company presents Jeffrey Holland in. Oh, lovely. It, okay. it doesn't make this. It's not a registered company, but they wanted a company to use on the poster. <laughs> I created that as my fa- favourite silent short, yeah. The yeah. Finishing Touch, which I think is hysterical. It's wonderful. It's very, very clever and very inventive. Yeah. Uh, and you don't need dialogue. It is. No. At all, you know, really. It's just to see the wonderful actions. And you can see all those bunny steps on the plank and the plank breaks. You know, you can see, <laughs> you can see it coming and it drives you nuts. But you know he's going to do it anyway. And, it, and interestingly, they weren't very happy with it. Oh, they will. Right? I know. I know. I find astounding. It's a shame that because uh, it's it's uh, for me. I love it. It's just it's good. It it's got the colour of Laurel and Hardy in it. Oh yeah. You know yeah. what I mean by that? I know it's black and white, but I mean, you know what I mean by the colour. It's got the essence of yes. their comedy in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely. You know, wonderful. The way Babe takes a mouthful of nails. The, the the effect in the movie when he swallows yeah. those nails on his face when he looks at the camera. Oh, oh, it's great fun. Great fun. It is. It is great fun. That's an excellent choice. Okay, your finishing touch you have, and for your talkie short. Yes, I've got a couple of favourite talkie sh- shorts, uh, but I think if I was stranded with one, I think it would have to be um, not the music box, which is, is probably the best known. Uh, one, uh, but uh, I think for me it's, it's got to be towed in a hole. I knew you were going to say that. I just knew it. We're yeah. on the same wavelength. Yes. Oh, uh, well, there you go. You see, towed in a hole. Yeah. It, it's got it's got everything, and and it's because they they you know the the conflict between Stan and Ollie going on at the time, and and wonderful those isolated scenes with Stan down below, <laughs> you know, when he's got the black eye and he's playing yeah. lots of crosses with himself, you know. Now wait a minute. Isn't this silly? What? Here we are, two grown-up men acting like a couple of children. Why, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves, throwing water at one another. Well, you started it. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Well, I didn't. You certainly did. Well, I didn't. You certainly did. Well, I know that I didn't. You did, too. Well, if that's how you... Yes, and uh, and Babe's face when he hears the saw going. <laughs> yeah. What's and he doing down there? <laughs> uh, and then the wonderful moment I, I laugh out loud every time I see it is when Babe has been you know forward in the the paint, and he stands up and he gets over and he just leans on the side of the boat looking at Stan. <laughs> and Stan's yeah. scrubbing away, with his trumpet, scrubbing the chain, and he he looks up and he looks and he gives you know, this double take, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's right. and he's. And he just what he did, and he climbs back over the side, and then he disappears behind. It, and you, all you see are his eyes that's between, the, it? between the gaps in the plank, and that's just the funniest thing ever. Genius! But I still scream in laughter every time I watch that. That's it. It's those, it's those expressive eyebrows. Stan has some of the best eyebrows in the. Oh business. yeah! Just oh, yeah. they just float yeah. to up and down. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was born with the God-given eyebrows, so they do come in handy, actually. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's it. yeah, you've got the right eyebrows for the part. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, that's a great selection. Okay, and for your feature film, sir? Ah, well, there's only one, because that's Way Out West. Way Out West. And you, I could have chosen these for you. Well, yeah, yeah, I think every fan would say the same, wouldn't they, really? Yeah. Because it's got everything. 
It does. It's got absolutely everything in it. It's got movement. It's got drama. It's got you know slapstick. It's got visual effects. Yeah. How they did that dust cloud in the road? Yes, yeah. How the yeah. hell they did that in 1936, five and yeah. six or whatever it was? Uh, yeah. it, it amazes me. And you know, and then you've got those tickling scenes in the in the bed. Yes, yes. Nowhere and, and stand. Uh, it's <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff. And uh, the next, the next stretching. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the effects for the, for that time, but but they were they were very very good. One of the funniest moments for me is when you know Ollie goes into the bedroom to get dressed, and we cut back to the living room, and then he comes back out of the bedroom fully dressed and says, "How'd you get dressed so quick? None of your business." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was fabulous. I watched it. I watched it funnily if I watched it the weekend for the first time in a long time, and you forget just what a quality film that it really it is. is. The, yeah. the performances are just out of this world. They are so uh, complete. I don't know. I can't put words to it. That it's just wonderful. It's it's like it's art. It is just a pure yeah. art form. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Right. A great choice. Great yeah. selection. Right. Uh, and for your final selection, a Laurel and Hardy related book. Well, it has got to be uh, Randy Scrabbit's, you know, the magic behind the movies, the few, you know, improved version, yes. which is enormously heavy to carry. Yes. But anything and everything you want to know about <laughs> every single film ever made and all the people in it. Yes. You know, it, there's a woman called Grace in um, Perfect Day. Uh, I can't think of her surname now off the top of her head, but uh, it's the woman who screams goodbye. Yes, yes. She's yes. in she's in the sun lounger with her husband. And yes. when they're leaving, she's well come on, come back. And uh, I looked her up, I looked the uh, I looked the film up and I read it and he names her. Yeah. Randy yeah. names her in the of film. Course. And I yes. go- I Googled her and she's there on on, on um, you know, there's some footage about her. Yeah, and uh, every time we watch that film, Judy and I, Judy does a very good impression of her. <laughs> <laughs> so we go, we have all that every time. But Randy's book, I mean, it's just extraordinary, yeah. and I'm so glad he's con- uh, con- you know contributing to the new mag. Oh yes, that yeah, we're very very pleased. A big difference because yeah. there's nothing that man doesn't know. Or he's nothing, phenomenal. He's, nothing he's been he a guest on the know. podcast so many times. He yeah. is just he's phenomenal, absolutely extraordinary. phenomenal, extraordinary. You, I, I often think one of these episodes he'll run out of things to say, but it never happens. He is just yeah, he, he's, no. he's, that what you know what he doesn't know and what he hasn't given us. You know, we, we we know so much about the world of Laurel and Hardy thanks to Randy. He's just yeah, yeah superb, superb. The Laurel and Hardy universe. Yeah, all yeah. things connected. Yeah, it's right. amazing. Quite right. Wonderful choices, Jeffrey, and uh, I think you'll have a lovely time on your your atoll. Uh, and uh, if, if if we sail past any time, I'll give you a chance to, uh, to to swap. If you want, if you get fed up of one of those, I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. I'll... It's not likely. It's <laughs> no, not, not likely. It's not, not one of those. So. Not one of those. Um, so just finally, just while you've got our ears, um, are, are there any projects or anything that you'd like to plug just while you've uh, while you've got us, Jeffrey? No, no. I'm, I'm, the one I've got in the book at the moment is uh, is Mr. Laurel with Pool on the twenty sixth. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to a nice quiet Christmas because I've packed pantomime in now. I love I've, you. Oh right. Yes, I've got I've got beyond it. My my enthusiasm for pantomime has, has waned. Oh no, it hasn't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. I don't have the energy that I used to have um, yeah. now, and uh, it you know I've left my mark. I've done forty five. Oh, wow. seasons over my career yes. uh, and I think that's enough I've made yes. my mark I'll leave it to the rest of the world to get on with it now <laughs> well you certainly have made your mark Jeffrey that is uh, without doubt and uh, just finally thank you so much for spending this time with us today it's been it's been lovely to chat with you an absolute um, pleasure it's never never bored talking about Otto and Hardy and it's lovely to meet you absolutely and yourself and hopefully maybe you'll come on another show in the future absolutely yeah no problem anytime Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Jeffrey Holland. He's such a lovely man. It was a real treat to spend time with him. Uh, tickets for Jeffrey's final performance in 2022 are still available. Uh, he's appearing as Mr. Laurel at the Lighthouse in Poole in Dorset on the 26th of November 2022. Uh, and you can also, of course, check out his website for future dates in 2023. Links to all of this and much more can be found in the episode show notes as usual. 
And that's all for today. Thank you again to our guest, Geoffrey Holland, for spending time with us. Thank you to the Bohunks Orchestra for the wonderful music. And thank you for lending me your ears once again. So, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's a very goodbye from me. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye.